So, you are not going to have a, a, a quiz on this tomorrow. This is showing um, how to get DNA from cells. The first thing you have to do is get some cells from something. Um, in humans, they take, they can get DNA from any, almost any cell. They can get it from your hair. They can get it from your blood. Usually, they'll take a blood sample. What do hair cells look like? Um, they're epidermal cells that are kind of shaped like, kind of shaped like this. And then they're joined together real tightly to make the hair. Um, they're dead, but like your hair, these are dead cells, but there's DNA in them. So, so like they you donate hair. Someone with that wig robs a bank. There you go. Don't you got a murder. You got a murder mystery <laughs> novel right there. <laughs> no, let's take one of your hair. Um, rob a bank and then place it. You can then take the cells. Put them in a solution, put detergent in them. The detergent disrupts the cell because detergent is uh, lipid based. Almost all detergents are kind of fat based. And the, the lipids will come, the cell membrane, which is lipids, will kind of come apart in the detergent. They're no longer. Remember, the reason why the cell membrane exists in its shape is because it's in water, right? And the little lipids kind of cling to one another because they don't want to be near the water. Remember that? Well, if you put them in, not in water, but in detergent, they'll just come apart into the detergent. And now, now you can access the DNA because the outer membrane comes apart, the nuclear membrane comes apart, and the DNA just kind of spills out. Um, you uh, you can treat you can have other chemicals in there that breaks down the proteins, um, and you're just left with with the DNA. And then you you run it through a centrifuge. Um, the DNA is actually a little lighter than the rest of the cell stuff, so the rest of the cell stuff goes down at the bottom of the tube and the DNA will kind of be floating near the top. And you can take a glass rod and kind of pull the DNA out. This is, they have machines that can do this a lot more elegantly. Um, but this is how we could kind of do it in the lab if we wanted to get some DNA from a sample. Maybe we can do that. That might be fun to do. Did I do that with you all in ninth grade? No. Do you remember that? No? So. Um, what you can then do with the DNA is you can um, do a uh, procedure like that we did last week in the lab, a gel electrophoresis. Now, how is that done? Um, the, the DNA has to be cut to do a gel electrophoresis. It has to be cut with enzymes. I have an example here of four different DNA strands. Um, maybe you got it from your four suspects at a crime. You know, you take hair, you got four suspects. Andrew, you did it. Um, you take your four suspects, you take a hair sample, you separate out the DNA like I showed you. Now, usually, when you get a DNA sample from somebody, that's not enough DNA to work with. You need more than that. So what do you do? Yeah, you got to copy the DNA many, many times. I'll come back to this picture. How do you do that? How do you copy DNA over and over again? It's a procedure called PCR, polymerase chain reaction. The reason why we call it polymerase is we use um, DNA polymerase. Remember when we're copying DNA over here? 
You remember the DNA polymerase enzyme? Mm -hmm. If you have DNA that's just a single strand, and you have DNA polymerase enzyme, showing you how PCR works. So you take, so now you have, you, you, you got some of your suspect's DNA in a test tube. Here's the DNA from the suspect in the test tube. You have to, um, you have to make many copies of it. How are we going to do that? Well, let me get rid of the RNA nucleotide. Get those out of the way. Here we go. In the test tube, you simply put DNA polymerase 3 enzyme, put a bunch of those in the test tube with, with the suspect's DNA, and you put a bunch of free nucleotides in there. You can obtain free nucleotides from cells. That's a different procedure, but it's easy enough to do. Free nucleotides, the DNA you're interested in, and a DNA polymerase. They use a special form of DNA polymerase. It's called TAC polymerase. T-A-Q, TAC polymerase. TAC polymerase is a really cool type of DNA polymerase. They got it from bacteria that live in these real hot, um, volcanic pools like in Yellowstone. Have y'all ever seen those real hot pools? I went to Yellowstone. You went to Yellowstone, you saw the bubbling like, what do they call those things? A hot... Geysers? Geysers. Geysers shoot up. Oh, oh, the, the thingies, the hot springs? Hot springs, thank you. They're called geysers. So, the geysers, the geysers shoot up the hot water every once in a while. But these hot springs are real hot, and there's almost nothing living in it except these Archaeans that can survive these boy, almost boiling water temperatures. They got DNA polymerase from one of those bacteria. It's called TAC polymerase because the bacteria they got it from, I think TAC is it's, are y'all with me? You seem like you're not. Um, the TAC is like the name of the bacterium. It's, that's short for the name of the bacterium, I think. Um, but anyway, this TAC polymerase can survive real hot conditions. It doesn't denature very easily. Okay, are y'all with me here? Then what they do is they take the test tube and they heat it up real hot. What happens when you heat DNA up real hot? It'll come apart. It'll break apart at the at the little hydrogen bonds that join the bases. And that breaks apart. The sides are too tough. It won't break apart that way. But if you heat it up to the right temperature, it'll break apart this way. OK? Then you let it cool down. Then these DNA polymerase will um, start attaching nucleotides. Now. In actuality, there's also small sequences called primers that connect to the front of the, the gene you want. They connect, there's, there'll be a little primer that connects on this side, they're called DNA primers. And there'll be a little primer that connects down here. And then the DNA polymerase can attach and start putting down nucleotides. It just starts putting down nucleotides one by one on this side, and it'll put them down one by one on the other side, too. So down here going up, of course, it goes in the opposite direction on the other side. So it starts putting them down here, and it does this relatively quickly. And so it'll go on this side and on this side, and, make, and you'll have two copies where you had one before. And that takes just a few minutes. And then they let it, they heat it back up, and it'll separate again. 
and then they cool it down and the primers will attach and the sides will be copied and then they heat it up again. Each time it's called a cycle. It's actually called a thermo cycle. Thermo meaning hot and cycle meaning, meaning it copies. It goes through a cycle. Every time it goes through a cycle, it makes a copy. So the machine that does PCR is called a thermo cycler. Thermocycler does PCR. And so you can go in about just several hours, you can do many, many cycles. Can y'all see that this will be an, uh, a, uh, this will, this, this will progress like real fast. Like you go from one copy to two, to four, to eight. 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024, 2048, 4096, 8192, 16384, 32768, 65405. Okay, champion. Yeah, I've seen. Pretty good, huh? In just a few hours, you have 65,000 copies. Would you like to see video footage of PCR? So you got to get a lot of copies of the DNA to work with. When we injected into our gels, we didn't just have one strand of DNA, we had millions of copies. Copy. What? Come uh, on, you two. How are you going to be a trillion dollar company? Oh, here we go. This is, like, this is one of my favorite videos. Ray's chain reaction, or PCR, uses repeated cycles of heating and cooling to make many copies of a specific region of DNA. First, the temperature is raised to near boiling, causing the double-stranded DNA to separate or denature into single strands. When the temperature is decreased, short DNA sequences known as primers bind or anneal to complementary matches on the target DNA sequence. The primers bracket the target sequence to be copied. At a slightly higher temperature, the enzyme TAC polymerase, shown here in blue, binds to the prime sequences and adds nucleotides to extend the second strand. This completes the first cycle. In subsequent cycles, the process of denaturing, annealing, and extending are repeated to make additional DNA copies. After three cycles, the target sequence defined by the primers begins to accumulate. After 30 cycles, as many as a billion copies of the target sequence are produced from a single starting molecule. Wasn't that great? Mm -hmm. So, this, this shows you, using these primers, shows you, they don't, they don't copy the entire genome. Your, your DNA is six billion letters long, okay? If they want to tell the difference between Andrew and Josie, they don't, they don't copy their entire genome. That would take too long. They go to a specific site on the DNA that's different in almost everyone. Okay? There's part of Andrew's DNA. Most of Andrew's DNA and Josie's DNA, even though they're different people, are exactly the same. Right. You know, they code for parts of the cell and stuff that everybody has. But there are some sequences that are very different between Josie and Andrew. And those are defined by the primers. So you, you get these primers that attach to the, what's called the variable sequences. And you can see how they attach to either end. And you just end up with a short piece that's a variable sequence. And that's the one we're going to use to put into our gels. These are the variable sequences between people. And they're, just sh they're shorter sequences. 
And so you don't have to take as long. You don't have to copy the entire DNA for Josie and Andrew. You just copy the variable sequence. Are you with me so far? Do you want to be a forensic scientist and catch serial killers? It's just like on TV. Everyone looks exactly like those TV actors and wraps up in an hour usually. I'm sure. With a few commercials. And you catch the killer at the end. So. If I had to do it all over and I couldn't be a teacher, I would probably be a forensic scientist. This is cool stuff. Now, so this this picture here is trying to explain what, what was shown in that video. Um, so now what do we do? Now we have the, the different sequences here. Now we have to cut them. They're cut with these things. They're called restriction enzymes. A restriction enzyme is an enzyme that looks for a certain sequence. This one's called ECO-R1, and it looks for the sequence GAA-TTC. Now, GAA-TTC is a palindrome. It's GAA-TTC this way. And as you may realize, on the other end, GAA, TTC, on the other side, what attaches to G? C. What attaches to A? T. What attaches to T? A. What attaches to C? G. So it's GAA, TTC this way, it's GAA, TTC that way. And so this is an enzyme, it's called ECO-R1. There's, it's, a, it's called a restriction enzyme. It's an enzyme that cuts DNA at that sequence. And it cuts between the G and the A. But it also cuts on this side between the G and the A. And what you end up with is a jagged cut. Let me show you how this works. Now this one, this enzyme just kind of reads the DNA. Did y'all remember the one from the video the other day? It just kind of spirals around. This thing will spiral around, reading the DNA, and this, this, whoever this blue DNA is doesn't have a GAATTC sequence, so they're not going to be cut. Maybe that's Josie's DNA. I don't know. Yeah. And this is Andrew's DNA, and it's looking for the sequence, looking for the sequence, and bam, there it is, GAATTC. And on the other side, GAATTC. And it's going to snip, snip, it snips on both sides, and voila. Whoa. Cuts the DNA. And it leaves these little edges called sticky ends. And we'll talk about how the sticky ends are used in biotechnology in, uh, in, in moving DNA from one location to another. But look at this. This is somebody else's DNA. I don't know. Um, maybe it's Lottie's DNA. And we cut GAATTC. There's a sequence there. And maybe there's another sequence. Bam, right there. And there's Lottie's DNA is cut into three pieces. And I don't know, Jossie's DNA here, GAATTC cut it there, and GAATTC cut it there, and GAATTC, there's another one there, cut it there. Look, at Jossie's got cut into four pieces. Ooh. So when you, when you put the DNA and you squirt it into the gel, it's going to make different uh, different DNA fingerprints based on the fact that the small pieces move far through the gel and the big pieces don't move as far through the gel. So if we were to squirt this into a gel, I'm running out of time here, so I'm kind of rushing. If we were to squirt this one into a gel here, it would have four pieces. The, the big one wouldn't go very far and the little ones would go pretty far and the medium one would go, you know, like that. This would have four pieces. But if we squirt this guy into, into the gel, it's just one big piece. It's not going to go very far at all. And so that's this person's DNA fingerprint, and that's this person's DNA fingerprint. Does that make sense? But you're not just cutting one piece. You're cutting 10 million pieces. But you cut, even though there's 10 million pieces, there'd be 10 million long strands. 
10 million of this size, 10 million of this size, and 10 million of this size. And that's enough to see the bands. When you have 10 million long pieces, you can see the band. If you just had one piece, you wouldn't be able to see it. It's too small. Does this make sense? Yeah. Okay, that's like the first part of that chapter. So, um, we're out of time. Peace out.